tonight we're going to continue in the book of Esther. So tonight's Bible reading is the chapter number two of Esther, the second chapter. So you can open up to Esther in the Old Testament, on your phones, in your Bibles, and we'll read from the beginning of chapter two. Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, who he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's orders and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Uh, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Sashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go, for, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than, more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. 
And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. All this is recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we are continuing here through Esther chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, uh, please keep it open so you can follow along uh, with this passage. We've got quite a few verses here, um, but we'll try and take it uh, in a sweep. I was quite taken back uh, this week just looking uh, at the passage and just being able to dig into it. And I guess the thing that struck me was uh, how raw this passage is. And in so many ways, God could have sugarcoated it uh, to make it a little bit more palatable, uh, palatable for our ears. Uh, but he just didn't do that. So there's quite some mature themes here in this text. Um, but I guess the way we're going to look at it, we'll work through, work through the story. And then we'll ask some hard questions uh, about the passage, um, some issues that it raises. And then we'll see the point of it, what God's doing here and what he would have us to see. So... Um, Please join me as we pray and ask the Lord for his help as we look into this uh, ancient text from his word. Father, we uh, just thank you for this time of worship. And uh, we have left our homes uh, this afternoon to come and worship you. Uh, We are not a social club, Lord. We are people who've been bought with blood and the blood of your Son. And we've been made children, and now we are worshippers of the true God. We used to worship idols in ourselves, but now we've come, and it's our delight to worship you. And Lord, we just thank you for part of this worship. We have this holy book, your word, which is your gift to us. We hear you speaking, you revealing yourself and your will for our lives your plan of salvation unfolding. And we just pray that you would be pleased tonight to draw near to us as we've come to draw near to you and pour out your Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit move in and around this place upon each person, upon me. And I pray that we'd all hear from you. Confront us with your greatness, that we might see who you are. The glory be to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our first uh, point this evening, if you're taking notes, uh, we see the beast's dark kingdom. The beast's dark kingdom. Now, just look quickly here at verse 1 of the chapter. Reads, uh, Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he'd decreed about her. Now, The biblical author here wants us to call to mind the events of chapter 1. Now, for those of you who were here last week and it's still somewhat fresh in your mind, you remember uh, Xerxes gathered in rulers and nobles from the 127 provinces of his empire. He brought them in and he threw a six-month-long banquet and a tour for them. And then after that, on the back of that, he threw a week-long banquet for all the citizens in his city. And he did this. And at the height of the banquet, when the wine was flowing in front of all of his guests, he summoned for his wife, the queen, to come out and do a little dance in her crown. And she refuses him in front of all of his guests And he is shamed, and he takes the throne from her. Now, that's the context here, what's going on, because it says he remembered what Vashti had done. Now, Queen Vashti dishonors uh, Xerxes in 483 BC. It says, remember in chapter 1, verse 3, uh, this happened in the third year of his reign. Now, we know the events of chapter 2, happened some four years later, because in in verse 16 of our text, it says uh, this all happened in the seventh year of his reign. So between chapter 1 and the events of chapter 2, four years have passed, about four years. So there's a big gap in the chapter. Now, we need to ask the question, what happened 
in these three years between chapter 1, his shaming, and chapter 2 as he's sitting reflecting on what happened to him. History tells us that Xerxes wasn't spending those three years crying on his bed, moping about what happened. Rather, it was the opposite. We looked at last week the reason why he summoned all the nobles for that banquet. Why was it? Because he wanted to strengthen their loyalty because he was planning a full-scale invasion in Greece. And he wanted to make sure all the rulers of his provinces saw how great his glory and his power was so that when it was time to take up arms to fight Greece, they were right behind him. He had motives for this. So in the three years between chapter 1 and chapter 2, he invades Greece. What happened? How did the military campaign go? Well, he had a humiliating defeat. And in 479 BC, he withdrew back home with his tail in between his legs. And in that campaign of his loss, he burned through his wealth. He burned through his resources. The victory didn't come as he expected. So what was life like for the king post-war, post-defeat? Well, he lost credit amongst his provinces and he lost his wealth. So what did he do? How did he deal with it? How did he cope with his failed endeavors? Well, historian Herodotus tells us that he drowned his sorrows in sexual promiscuity. That's what he did. He goes so far to even say that Xerxes had sexual relationships with even some of the wives of his own officers. What was the result? Well, fast forward a few years Anger amongst his own men led to him being assassinated in his own bedroom, which took place in 465 BC. But chapter 2 verse 1 opens with the king licking his own wounds. He's come home from defeat and the battle cries and the bloodshed is over and he comes back empty-handed. And his losses in that battle remind him of the shame that was brought to him by his queen when she refused him and what she did. And the king's attendants, Xerxes' attendants, they see him blue. They see him dejected. They see him down. And so they seek to turn his situation around. And they offer him a proposal. They come up with an idea. Look at the proposal, verses 2 to 4. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem of the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Hegai, the king's unit, who is eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. So their proposal is a kind of beauty pageant. On an empire scale, it's kind of like a modern reality TV show, right? Search for Persia's next top queen. But to modern ears, I mean, when we look at this, this kind of process for the selection of a queen, it's kind of startling, right? That, that, that the new queen would be chosen this kind of way. But we may be tempted to think, well, maybe that was just normal for ancient times and in that kind of empire. Maybe that was just normal. Well, actually, it wasn't normal. It was not normal practice, even in the Persian Empire. Now, Xerxes' father, when he was king, Darius, he chose his wives wives from the families of the nobles and the princes. That's how queens were chosen. But again, this idea, it's thought up and it's brainstormed by Xerxes' attendants. This is their proposal to him. So so not only, though, is it out of the norm, this process, it's incredibly dark and wicked, this plan that they come up with. The servants are sent out into all the provinces of the empire, and who were they searching for? Who did the search go out to? Beautiful young virgins. And when they found beautiful young virgins, they would be taken and carted to the king's city. Now, these virgins were single, they were unmarried, they were young. And the process is, they weren't asked. The parents weren't consulted if this was okay. They were forcefully taken because in verse 8 it says, the king made a decree and he gave his edict. Their virginity, which was a precious possession, guarded. 
was taken and it would be taken. It is nothing less, what we read here, nothing less than legal trafficking. Now again, this is the idea that belongs to the king's attendants. They came up with this. It's so dark though. It's so evil in a sense what, what's happening here. But the proposal, the way that they frame it, they aim it at the king's pride and they aim it at his lust. Now it addresses his lust because we're going to bring to you the most beautiful young virgins in all the land. So it appeals to his lust, but it also appeals to his pride. And you can choose out of them a queen instead of Vashti. Remember what she did? You can replace her. This is how the proposal went. And so we have to ask, what kind of man does it take to accept a proposal like this? What kind of wretched man would it take to accept a proposal like this? Look at the end of verse 4. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now, most of us know how the story unfolds. It comes out kind of like a beauty and the beast tale, right? But make no mistake, the beast in this story is a beast in the absolute truest and darkest sense of the term. The advice appealed to him, so the taking of these young women would diminish their dignity as women made in the image of God. It would strip them of their God-given rights and they would be used as objects for personal gain. So we should be horrified as we read this. I mean, this is history. Last week, we made very clear to look at the genre of this book. It is not, uh, it is not uh, fiction. It's historical narrative. Now, as we look at this horrified at it, we would expect the biblical author to comment at how wicked this all is, wouldn't we? We'd expect a, expect a little comment in the text, but he gives none, not once throughout the story, not one comment. Now, the biblical author is not condoning what's going on here by being silent. What's he doing? He's simply showing us this is what life is like in the kingdom of darkness. This is what it's like. And notice, though, there's many things the biblical author doesn't comment on. He doesn't comment on how dark life was for young men in the Persian Empire. How difficult it was for them. It was actually just as bad. Eunuchs are frequently mentioned throughout the book of Acts. We've read it, right? Haggai the eunuch. Historians tell us, especially Herodotus, records that each year around 500 young boys were taken from their families and brought into the citadel. And each of them were castrated and made as eunuchs to serve in the king's palace. And they would be servants who didn't get caught up in funny business in the palace. Denied any opportunity for marriage and a family. Again, eunuchs are frequently mentioned throughout this book. And the biblical author doesn't comment once on the wickedness of it. Not once. But the point that he's showing us, this is what life is like in the kingdom of darkness. This is how it functions. So whether you're a male or female, no one was safe in the Persian Empire. No one was. Remember last week we looked at, we considered, no man, no king has ever been able to handle absolute power. Even the best of the earthly kings, Solomon, his power led to his great undoing and he went astray. Even the greatest of kings, King David, absolute power led him to feed his own lust, commit adultery, then use his power to cover up the adultery with murder. There's only one king who can handle absolute power, and it is King Jesus. He is the only one not corrupted by it. But the story moves on. Look at verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. So girls from every province of the empire, they're taken and they're brought to Susa. Now, uh, this was a massive task. Remember, uh, Chris, can you just put on the map? Remember last week we saw the map. So these, look, look how large this empire is, right? From the edge of Greece all the way to India, down to the tops of northern Africa. These women, these young virgins are taken from provinces scattered all throughout that empire, and they're taken to Susa, just, just right of Babylonia there. 
So some of these girls have to travel over a thousand kilometers just to get here. This is a massive task. This is huge just for the king, just for his lust, just for his pride. But nothing was too big of an ask for the king. Thanks, Chris. It was a huge expense. But they all arrive in Susa for the pageant. But it's interesting that even the world's most beautiful virgins are not fit for King Xerxes, right? Look, look at the competition. Look at the process. Look at verses 12 to 14. Before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil and myrrh, and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and, and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned by name. So these girls, after their journey, a bath for refreshments that didn't cut it. That was enough. They had to undergo 12 months of beauty treatment, it says. Look at the details that we get here. Six months with oil of myrrh treatment and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. So this would be long process of bathing in these oils and perfumes. And it would be almost fumigating themselves over oils and fragrances that would be burned. And it would the fragrances, they'd have to sit over them and it would be absorbed into the skin over long periods of time. Twelve months of this. And the Holy Spirit records these details, the extent of the details, to stun the reader. This is astonishing. And all of this for the pride and lust of the king. This huge process. But again, the details are far darker than just that. Look again carefully at verse 14. I mean, I mean, look what's written here. In the evening, she, one of the virgins, would go into the king's palace and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the con- concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. So once these young, young women completed their 12-month process, they would each get to see the king one at a time. And each night, one of them would get an invitation to the king's bedroom, and they were summoned. And then it says, in the morning, they were sent out of his room, and they were sent to another harem. Now, the context here is, Persian kings had one or more wives. That was normal. But they had many concubines, many. These women, purely for sexual fulfillment. That was what they were for. And these, these women, these concubines, they would live in the king's harem. They would live in luxury. They would live in quarters that were just for them. All the food they needed, all the clothes, anything they needed, that was where they lived and did life. And then only occasionally, if they were one who actually pleased the king, they would be summoned for pleasure. And then they'd be sent and that would be their life. That's where they lived. History tells us with Artaxerxes, he had 360 concubines in his harem. Those who were the most beautiful in all the land. Now this is the scenario in our passage. Each one, one by one, to the king's bedroom. These virgins made in the image of God, taken for this, for one night with the king. And then after that one night, they were assigned a permanent place in his harem. One writer, the guide, he, he writes this, quote, and he captures the darkness of it. Quote, the king wished to add to his collection of living dolls. Those chosen would live in secluded splendor for the rest of their lives, even if they were only rarely taken out and played with. End quote. So after the one night, they weren't allowed to return to their families. Marriage was now forever off the cards. And if they became pregnant, the child would be taken and raised as a servant in the king's palace. See, we are reading of what happens to a culture that does not have the knowledge of the one true God. Does not have the knowledge. Look at what becomes of a people without the scriptures. 
Look at what becomes of a people without the revelation of God, without the Holy Spirit. This is what you see unfold. It is pure darkness. And we ask, how far could people be from God's design? How far could you possibly be? Compare that to the beginning of our scriptures, Genesis 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and he shall be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Could we be any further from that with how our culture functioned here? How far could we possibly be? And so here we see the consequences of forsaking God and his ways. Sin brings destruction, misery, pain, and darkness. That's what it brings. Xerxes' kingdom was sex-driven. The same thing happened in Paul's generation, in Paul's time. What does Paul say about his generation, about the pagans? Ephesians 5.12, For it is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. That's what Paul says of his day. And what about our world today? Are we any better? 4.8 million people today are victims of sexual trafficking. There are about 42 million prostitutes worldwide. A 2017 international survey found men had an average of eight sexual partners in their life journey, up to date with women just under that percentage. 35% of all internet downloads are porn-related. The kingdom of darkness is always dark. It's always dark. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing, there is nothing new under the sun. So what's the point of all these distressing details? Why, why are we spending time here? Why is it all recorded? Well, the reader, as we look at this, is pushed to conclude, as you consider what's going on here, God must be a million miles from this place. We are reading of a God-forsaken empire. You have to feel that way. Surely our advice would be to people living here, run for your lives. The city's fate would be exactly like Sodom and Gomorrah. Get out of there. And yet the Holy Spirit is setting the stage for an altogether unexpected ray of light in the darkness. And it leads to our next point, a beautiful candle in the darkness. Now we're introduced to two new figures in the plot. First one in verses 5 to 6. Look at verses 5 to 6 with me. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So... We read of here a man named Mordecai. We find out that his great-grandfather was exiled uh, in the taking of of, uh, Israel with Babylon. So he was born into exile. His grandparents were taken, and he grew up in exile outside of the promised land. But what's the first detail given about Mordecai? What's the very first detail mentioned? What does it say? He was a Jew. He was a Jew, and he was living in Susa. Now, the fact that he's a Jew is good news to the reader. Hold on a second. In the darkness, there's someone here who's part of God's covenant people. Mentions he's a Jew. But it says he's living in Susa. This is bad news for the reader. This means that he is one of the Jews who was unwilling to go back to Jerusalem when it was time to rebuild the temple. He would prefer to stay outside the promised land because life had become comfortable. And he didn't go back with all the other Jews to the promised land to rebuild the temple. So yes, he's a Jew, but he's a compromised Jew, at least in some sense. And now we're introduced to the second figure in the plot. Look at verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. So now we're introduced to an orphan girl. She's young, and her cousin Mordecai adopts her because her father and mother were killed, and he becomes a father figure. 
So immediately we're introduced to a girl who's had a rough start to life. Her parents have been killed. But she goes by two names, it says. She's known as Hadassah, which is her Jewish name, which means myrtle tree. And the other name that she's given is Esther, which seems to be the Hebrew version of Ishtar. And what's Ishtar? Ishtar was the name of the Babylonian goddess of war and love. Given a Babylonian name. Now it's interesting that this is the first and last time she's ever called by her Jewish name. The rest of the book she's only identified as Esther. It's in a sense she's living as a dual citizen, right? She has two names. She's in a sense part of two kingdoms. She's got the blood of the covenant people of God running through her veins. But she's living outside the promised land as a Gentile citizen. And this dual citizenship that she has will be significant in the coming chapters because her allegiance will be tested. Which kingdom does she truly belong to? It will be tested soon. Who will she identify as? Now, our circumstances, friends, as Christians, is very similar, isn't it? We too are dual citizens. We, we, our names are registered with the country that we live in. But it also says in Philippians 2, we, our citizenship is in heaven. Christian, is your name not written in the book of life? You belong to heaven, just not there yet. And we too have this dual citizenship and we need to try and live in this world but not of this world. And be assured of it, the time is coming if it has not already come when the test of your citizenship will be put forward, where your allegiance is, who you really belong to. But this is how the Holy Spirit introduces her and he adds just one more detail. It says in verse 7, she was lovely in form and figure. Lovely in form and figure. Remember, she's living outside Israel's promised land. She's living amongst the pagans. She's living in the kingdom of darkness. So how is she described? Is she described according to the values of God's kingdom? Or is she described according to the values of the kingdom of darkness? Look what it says, twofold description. She had an attractive face, it's literally saying, and she had an attractive figure. Both of them. Attractive face, attractive body. And yet, knowing the pageant is the scenario, God chooses to make her beautiful in form and figure. Psalm 139, you knit me together in my mother's womb. We all come to, in different shapes and sizes. God makes us, and God chose to make her this way. He had a plan for where she was living in the time she was living. And it is her physical beauty that got her noticed in her hometown. It's why she was recruited by Xerxes' scouts, because she was attractive. Look at verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hegai, who had charge of the harem. So she's taken with the rest of them. Now she's in the palace, she's enlisted in the competition, and she will join the 12-month program. There is a light here, a flicker. But thirdly, our third point tonight is we see favor amidst the darkness. Favor amidst the darkness. Now, look carefully, consider what happens to Esther. Look at this, it's just astounding. Verse 9. The girl pleased him. This is Haggai. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best places in the harem. She wins the favor of the managing director of the pageant. She gains his favor. Now, how did she do it? Was she just super cooperative? Was she fun to be around? Was she just super likable, one of those personalities that was just magnetic? Was she really humble and full of grace compared to all the other women? What was it? The Holy Spirit doesn't tell us. He doesn't give us the details. And we'll see that point, why he doesn't later on. But the extent of the favor, look at, look at it. It's just huge. She's immediately provided with special foods and beauty treatment. So she gets to jump the queue. She gets to start first. In the program, it says he assigned her seven maids from the king's palace. So she doesn't just have someone helping her with everything she's got to do. Seven maids are attending her. Whatever she needs, she's got seven servants around her all the time. 
And then thirdly, he moved Esther and her seven maids into the best place in the harem. She's promoted. She gets this best spot, the place of best opportunity. It's just overwhelming the favor that this young girl gets, all packed into one verse. And if that wasn't enough, look at verse 15. When the turn came for Esther... The girl Mordecai had adopted the daughter of his uncle Abihail to go to the king. She asked for nothing other than what Hegai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. Now, everyone who lays eyes on Esther, she wins their favor. We're all familiar with that saying, right? No matter how hard you try, you will not please everyone. So whether you're a president, whether you're a celebrity who wins an Oscar, Whether you're an athlete who is the greatest on the planet, you will always have your critics and you'll always have people who just don't like you. And yet we read here, search all the corridors of the palace and you will not find one person who does not like Esther. She won the favor of all of them, everyone who saw her. But having said all that, it's the next step that counts, right? Doesn't really matter if she wins Haggai's favor. Doesn't matter if she wins everyone's favor in the palace, what does it matter? She has to win the favor of the king. That's what matters at the end of the day. Look at verses 16 to 18. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tibeth in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any other woman. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Favor. How many times does it have to come up in the text till we realize something is happening in the life of this girl? There are things at work here. Chapter 1. The king calls a banquet and calls for Vashti to come out in her crown. Chapter 2, the crown is taken from Vashti and put on Esther's head and a banquet is thrown for her. Favor, favor from every side. Remember we looked at last week, one of the key things in in, in the book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned once in the entire book. Friends, God's fingerprints are all over every single detail of this book. He is everywhere and he is working everything out. Xerxes thinks that the choosing of the queen will rest solely upon him. And he doesn't realize that the choosing of the queen will come through him, but he will choose the queen of God's own choosing. That's what will happen. Yes, he freely chooses, and not by holy standards, but he will choose God's queen. It was interesting, just this past week, uh, I caught up with a Christian brother from the church at a cafe, and we met up, and it was just, we just planned for the two of us to catch up. I thought nothing of the, cha- of the table that we chose to, sat, to sit at outside, and little did we know that we were going to choose the table of God's own choosing. We were having fellowship and we're just sitting there talking. And then a lady came and sat down in the one spare table that was next to us. Everything else was full. And she sat down and we just continued talking, me and him. And then she interrupted our conversation and she said to us, I've just been listening to everything you've said. And I am just so encouraged by what you guys have been talking about the Bible, how you've been talking about the scriptures. And I, I just is exactly what I needed. And you won't believe it. I'm actually looking for a church at the moment. I've moved and I just want to know more about God. And I'm just loving what I'm hearing at the moment. And so anyway, we chatted with her. We turned and we chatted with her for the next 20 minutes and encouraged her and, and told her some things of what she should look at in a church to encourage her. We weren't about stealing sheep, but we sought to encourage her. And then... Before we left, there was time for us to go. We sat there and we prayed with her. And she left so blessed. We left so blessed. Couldn't believe what happened. Now, we didn't realize. We, we just thought we were choosing any old table at the cafe. It was only afterwards that we realized that we chose the table according to God's own choosing. 
He was behind all of it, a seemingly normal event, because his purposes will stand. Xerxes has no idea who he's chosen for the crown. She just pleased him. He had no idea the plan of God that was unfolding before his eyes. He just couldn't see it. Leads to our final point this evening. Our final point is a bigger kingdom at hand. A bigger kingdom at hand. Look at verses 19 and 20. Bit of a shift in the story. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. Now, again, this is just reinforcing. Though God is at work behind the scenes, we're not puppets. We make choices, free choices. Esther has made choices here. But notice the biblical author doesn't linger on the point of the wedding, doesn't linger on the banquet, doesn't linger on, the, on her rise to, to complete fame, from, from nothing to everything, Does, doesn't linger on that. The po- it's because the wedding was not the goal. The crown is not the goal of the story. Rags to riches is not the point here. And God continues to move things forward according to his plan. Look at verse 21 to 23. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. All of this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. Now, we are all familiar with the assassination of JFK. Major event. Now, what is transpiring here is nothing less than that. The assassination plan of the, em- of the emperor himself. But God saves Xerxes' life. God spares this evil man. And how does God do it? God can do anything. He can use anyone he wants. How does God choose to do it? He chooses out of the whole world, out of the whole city, Mordecai. Chooses a Jew. And, and, and when does the event happen? It happens just after Esther has been made queen. So Mordecai can take this news as a Jew, pass it on to the new queen who is a Jew, who will in turn report it back to the king of the empire. We start to see that coincidences don't, coincidences don't really exist in the book of Esther. So why interrupt this with this little story here? Why interrupt the celebrations of the banquet? Why, why is the biblical author doing this? Because this book is not about Esther. It's not about her. It's not about Xerxes and it's not about Mordecai. It's about God. This book is about God who works in dark circumstances. He works in dark places. It is about the God who made an incredible promise to Abraham in the past. And it is a God who is faithful to keep that promise that through Israel, all the nations of the world will be blessed. It is about a faithful God who fulfills his promises in incredible and unexpected ways. But, and we saw that last week, But as we get to this point, it leaves the reader asking so many questions. So many questions on our mind. Questions about Mordecai's actions. Questions about Esther's actions. What what are some of these questions? Well, firstly about Mordecai. In the text, on two different occasions, in verse 10 and verse 20, it says twice that Mordecai forbade Esther from disclosing her Jewish identity. Two times the author writes that. Now, why, why, why does he do this? A Jew's ethnicity was so closely tied in to their relationship with Yahweh. They knew Yahweh because of their identity. He chose to love the Jews. He chose them as his people. And the one thing that connects her to Yahweh, Mordecai says, do not mention. Don't say anything about what people you belong to. So how could he tell her this? She's now in the the palace for, for years. That's years without witnessing to anyone. No evangelism about the one true God. There's idols everywhere. And she says nothing. 
Mordecai tells her not to do it. Was he afraid? Was he fearful of her, of it happening? Did he think that if she kept silent, it would help her cause? Had he become ashamed of Yahweh? Listen, the, what he does here is like me coming up to someone in the church, a young person coming up and, say, and says to me, um, Nathan, can you pray for me on Monday because I have a job interview? And it's like me going back to them and saying, make sure you highlight all your strengths, everything that you contribute, but do not mention that you're a Christian. Don't do it. Is it any different what Mordecai does here? Is it any different to that? But all these questions, the Holy Spirit leaves unanswered. But the questions that we have for Esther are even more troubling. Think about it. What should we make of Esther's compliance throughout this story? What should we make of it? It seems to completely clash with the will and the desire of God. Sex outside of marriage is fornication. How much more so with a, with a pagan, with an idolater, someone who's not a Jew? You remember Esther? When he comes out of Babylon and he comes back and some of the Jews, they start intermarrying with the, with the Gentiles, he blasts them, you spiritual adulterers. And he starts ripping out his beard in distress. Esther does all of this. But we, we ask, did Esther have a choice to refuse so powerful a king and so forceful an invitation to his bedroom? Did she really want to refuse? Did she think it was a good opportunity winning the crown to the greatest kingdom? Doesn't the story show that refusal is always possible though? Isn't Vashti an example of that? She stood up to the king. She got out safely. Refusal is always an option. So what was it? Did she fear death more than God? Couldn't God have made her queen even through defiance if that was his plan? And God's proven that he can do that, right? Remember Joseph? He's r r raising up in the ranks in Egypt. And what happens? He's tempted and called to do something immoral. Sleep with Potiphar's wife. Keep his position. And he says, how can I sin against God like this? And he suffers because of that righteous refusal. He's thrown into prison. But what does God do? God's got plans for him. And after all his suffering, God eventually makes him prime minister of Egypt. God can use refusal and obedience in the face of opposition. And what about Daniel and his friends? The situation's almost identical, right? They're exiled in Babylon and they're commanded to eat food that was against the law of Yahweh. And what does Daniel and his friends do? They say, hey, we can't eat this. Please let us eat what God has said we can eat and you'll see that we will come good. And they're given favor by righteously refusing. And then it gets to the point where they are commanded to bow down to the idol. And they refuse. And they're thrown into the fire. And it's made a law by the king that you can't pray to any other god. And what does Daniel do? He prays. And he's thrown into the lion's den. What happens to the three men? What happens to Daniel? They, they're raised up to positions of authority. What these men stand for, Esther didn't. I mean, they refused, and Esther just complied with the whole process. So, so what are we to make of this? Is God okay with it? Is, is he fine? I mean, how many sermon titles and conferences have been named entitled Dare to Be an Esther? Is that really what the book serves for? Is she supposed to be an example for us? Friends, it's not about Esther. It's not about imitating her. The Holy Spirit is intentionally silent on all of these questions. Why? Because God is making one thing clear. It's about Him. It's about God working in extraordinary situations, in ordinary situations. God working in nobodies. God working in kings. And it's about God fulfilling the greatest rescue mission this world has ever known bringing his son into this world. It's not just about saving Esther's generation of Jews. It's about saving those Jews so that the Messiah can be born, so that the knowledge of God will extend past the borders of Israel to every corner of the earth, and the Son of God will redeem men and women from every tribe, nation, and tongue. It is about God. 
So that's why the Holy Spirit doesn't answer all these questions. He doesn't want you to follow Mordecai. He doesn't want you to follow Esther. It's not why it's recorded. It's about him and the salvation he will bring. Let me close as I look at chapter 2, and even just thinking through it this week, it is a distressing chapter. It is dark. It is raw. It's not sugar-coated. It's tragic. It's uncomfortable, and it's unpleasant. It was for me, at least. And it's, perhaps it's nicer to hear the Sunday school versions of the story of Esther, isn't it? But that's not the way the Holy Spirit presents it to us. And friends, it's exactly the way that the the Holy Spirit and God gives us the gospel, isn't it? It doesn't present it all sugar-coated. It begins with the tragedy of our rebellion. It begins with darkness. It begins with our sin being so great that God is angry with us and that we deserve a place called hell. And, and, and it begins with us contributing to the darkness of the kingdom, us being at fault, and it's uncomfortable, and it's unpleasant, and it's not nice. It doesn't seem like good news, but it's at that point. It's at that point when the darkness is so strong that a ray of light begins to pierce the soul. Isn't it? And the candle flickers, and the hope of the good news comes forth, emerges. Esther emerges out of nowhere. And in the same way, in a little town of Bethlehem, out of nowhere, a baby is born from a virgin, from nobodies. And he will come and he will lay down his life for sinners so that they may be forgiven and have eternal life. This is God. This is how he presents it raw. He presents it how it is. But this is what God has done and it is available. Esther is driving every single one of us. Believe in God's plan of redemption, and the plan of redemption is bound up in a person, and it's Jesus Christ. Do you know him tonight? Do you know him? It's all about him. Let me pray. Father, we thank you again for our time in your word, uh, your precious gift to us. We thank you for this ancient book, no fairy tale, but the very words of the living God. We thank you that we have it. We thank you that we have the time to consider it. And we pray now what we have heard and what we have read would move from the mind to the heart. I pray that all of us would behold the Savior with unveiled faces. Lord, may all of us be led to adoration and worship of the God who is over this universe. We thank you that you are faithful and the promise you made way back to Abraham was fulfilled through Esther's generation and was fulfilled in the coming of your son. Lord, we thank you that we have benefited and received the gift that has come through him. But Lord, any who haven't, may you draw them unto yourself tonight that they may repent and believe on him. Lord, may you make time to truly be of the essence for each soul here tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.